chef. My man, how you doing? Good to see you, brother. Big dog. Uh. Tonight is all about celebrating black men. You know, we're soft, we're goofy, we're funny, but we're not one thing. What are some stereotypes of black men, and how do they make you feel? What does a healthy romantic relationship look like to you? Tell me you're a black man without telling me you're a black man. I don't go to the, the peephole. I just go to the window and get one of these. <laughs> <laughs> do you recall your first encounter with racism? What was that like? Seeing George Floyd pass really did a number on each of us. Black men lives are important. We need to live, we need to exist, we need to thrive, we need to love, we need to be fathers, we need to be leaders. We are gonna define ourselves, and we're gonna be the men that we wanna be. Like, we're human too. That's right. <laughs> Black father. Chef Richard! Yeah. My God, bring me in. What's up, baby? Hold me tight. Don't How let me doing, go. Man? Bring How me back doing? in, man. How you doing? <laughs> I'm excited, man. Same here, man. We got an amazing dinner, man. Black men talking about black love, mental health, emotions, masculinity, racism. Yes. And we got Joey Badass hosting the dinner. We got Bubba Wallace hosting the dinner. Mm -hmm. But we got the best dinner, Chef, because we got you. Chef Kwame. Yo, Mr. Badass. So what's going on tonight, man? What are we doing here? You brought me all the way out here from New York. I'm making jerk chicken on the side of, of a mountain. So listen, man, tonight is all about celebrating black men. We got a lot of icons coming through tonight. Mm -hmm. We got Oscar-nominated film producer and entrepreneur Charles D. King. Oh, yeah. Daniel Ezra, mm -hmm. you know, star of the hit series All-American. Yeah. We got Kendrick Sampson, you know, from the Insecure family. And we even got uh, Lil Rel Howery. Funny man. You know, funny man. <laughs> He's a funny, funny man. man. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So we're going to have an interesting conversation over some great food. You are opening the doors to black kids being able to dream that they can be a NASCAR. I appreciate it. So who's coming tonight? Starting off with the former athlete, Jay Barnett. Best-selling author, a therapist, promoting young black kings all across the world. Also, we have DeRay McKesson, outspoken activist who was praised by Obama himself. And last but not least, Bob the Drag Queen. Ooh. All right, Chef. I'm going to let you get to it, finish it up. We'll see you in there. All right, cool. Tell me who's coming to dinner, though. I'm man. glad you asked. We got Everett Taylor, uh -huh. tech mogul, young black CEO yes. of Kickstarter. We got Marcus Scribner, uh -huh. you know, from Blackish, grown as amazing, talented young actor. And my boy, Belief in Fatherhood. He's a content creator just like me, mm -hmm. father, husband, musician. Yes. It's brothers, man. Man, that's Chopping awesome. it up over your food. And that's what tops it off, am I right? Oh, you know you're right. <laughs> it's going to be good. something special. I can't wait, brother. Thank yes, you, sir. Chef. Send me something to the side when you cover with that foil. I'm excited to, uh, to have dinner with you guys tonight. There's a lot I like to talk about. I mean, there's a lot going on in the world. Yeah. You know, especially for black men, there's a lot we have to take in. We got good conversation followed up with good food. Black men from all walks of life. So we're going to talk about all of that over this man's food. Chef. Yes, sir. What we got coming to us first? What we have here is a seafood pot pie. It has uh, shrimp, crab, and also lobster in it. And then we finish it off with a wonderful puff pastry, which gives it that light buttery flavor and that crispiness right over the top. So you have texture, you have heat, you have smell, you have everything. All your senses are being evoked in this one dish right here. Let's get into it. Oh, that's buttery goodness. Oh my goodness. Wow. So I have some like fresh salmon bread, which is a bread from Morocco. It's like a laminated dough. We have some whipped black bean hummus. And then I have some Ethiopian spiced lamb in the center. Oh my God. Yeah, this is, this is like that, huh? Chef, tell us about these crab cakes. So just some lump crab meat. I do a little bit of spicy mango salsa. Uh, and the goal is that for my crab cakes, I want you to get all the crab meat. I know you're from Baltimore. And I know you bought your crab. I'm, I'm interested. So <laughs> there's a little small bite. You should get a little crunch on the outside, uh, some spiciness. So enjoy. Yeah, this is amazing. We might invite you uh, out to Baltimore. <laughs> so, gentlemen, everybody get a scroll. Each scroll has, like, you know, a different question. And that's how we start our conversation tonight. This feels so like, like we're like, like in a secret meeting. <laughs> Illuminati. So, yeah, like, pass your scrolls around. <laughs> Did you do these bows? I did this myself. This is also part of my picture. All right, Jay, what you got on your scroll, dog? Let's see. Tell me you are a black man without telling me you are a black man. Mm. I like to sit on the porch. <laughs> <laughs> West side of Chicago. Okay. I would say Renee. Like in spades or something like that? You knew it. Yeah. 
<laughs> Ginger ale is medicine. <laughs> and running without your shoes makes you faster. Absolutely. It's that unspoken accountability on your ash, right? So if Man. you're ashy and somebody see you ashy, it's almost a scold. <laughs> I was at a, a, a commercial shoot and I was I was like, yo, guys, I got to get some moisturizer. They were like, no, we need to get this last shot. I'm like, I promise you, <laughs> nobody is going to care about your product. They're going to be looking at how ashy my hands are. You know, um, I don't go to the, to the peephole. I just go to the window and get one of these. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> what about you, man? Um, I have a do rag drawer. That's a black right. man. That's a black, that's yes. black that man. That is a black man. Yeah. Socks with his All right, Dre, what's on your scroll? What are some stereotypes of black men and how do they make you feel? Um, some stereotypes aggressive, angry, like not participating in family. It make me feel sad because the black men I know, like, are not those stereotypes. I like know many examples that are that defy those, but I do think that the media perpetuates one type Correct. of image 100%. over and over and over. I agree with you on that. Yeah. We're expected to be the biggest, the strongest, the toughest, the meanest. I remember being a kid and like whether or not you can fight was so important. Yeah. It was really important. And that is weird. I'm gonna say that. That is strange. The fact that I had so many times I was told if you get beat up, don't come home. I'm homeless now? <laughs> I got my ass beat up now? <laughs> Damn! This is crazy! You know what I mean? And, and I think that's just, that's, just, that's just so messed up. One for me is that we're menacing. <laughs> we're strong, of course, but I think people think that's all we are. You know, we're soft, we're goofy, we're funny, but we're not one thing. Kev, why you got to point at me when you said goofy, man? <laughs> I'm feeling I just, some type I of way naturally, I just no, naturally no. went over there. But um, I completely agree, and I think when you don't meet that criteria of what other people see as, like, what a, what a black man should be, then it's like, oh, you're not black enough. Like, yeah. that... I hate that. I'm like, I am who I am, I'm born how I am, and, like, mm -hmm. people are allowed to be whichever way that they want to be. Uh, I don't know, just, you know, a little emotional about it, but it just, it is a frustrating type of situation. Why can't we as black people just be all types of ways, just like any other human being, you right. know what I mean? We're not a monolith. Exactly. Some yeah, of us like are. pumpkin pie. We're yeah. still black. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, no. Come we on. Just, I just, you just no, said. No. You just said we're different. That's questionable, though. Come on. <laughs> Sweet potato over everything, bro. You just so. said we're not a monolith. I'd say the stereotype for me, and, and I have a personal story to share with it, is because you're black, you can't have certain things. I was pulled over for passing a car that pulled out in front of me pretty close. And for a race car driver to say pretty close, it's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> Some stuff is like, eh, it wasn't very close at all, but get up to the stoplight, three cops get out of that car, walk up to the window, they're like, you better pull over in this parking lot. And I'm like, okay. Long story short, he comes up and he's like, hey man, it's your car. I was driving a Lexus GSF then. Is this your car? Yeah. You own this car? And those questions there, like, this was five years ago? So, like, I know what's going on. Like, I already know. But, but I wanted to be the smart ass, but I know where that gets black men mm -hmm. to a police officer. But they, they are so dumbfounded that, oh, you have nice things. Like, that's such a label that's put on us that pisses me off. I would say probably that black men don't have feelings. Mm. Yeah. I think that one bothers me a lot because, you know, when you think about who we are as human beings, why wouldn't we have feelings? And going back to what you said, I think the way the media portrays us and perpetuates this animal, this, this uncontrollable, incompetent, you know what I mean, that only wants to cause trouble. And I'm just like, you know, why wouldn't you think that we have feelings? And I think when you have that, how do you expect a black man to show up to express his feelings? Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think now society it really expects us not to say anything. I've gotten criticized from other black people. Oh, well, real, that's it. They're going to take everything away from you now because you, you do. But I'm like, for what? For telling the truth? Yeah. And also, I'm not afraid of that shit. Yeah. I work too hard to get here. Mm -hmm. You can't just take that shit away from me and I ain't do nothing. To be real, white people and non-black folks expect black people to pop off. Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. and they don't want us to speak up. They don't want us to, but they expect us. Yeah. They come in expecting, especially black men, to be violent, 
to be. Yeah, but that's what you know what I'm they, saying. They want yeah. they want that version that's of it. Yeah, exactly. They exactly. want that. But exactly. if you intelligently, eloquently right, speak right, right, something, right. they like, oh shit. Yeah. So you talk about what do they expect? I know what they don't expect. They don't expect for us to be coming together sure. the way we are, and that's the thing yeah. that I think is most refreshing about this younger generation. I remember when we were going through post George Floyd. Mm -hmm the millions of conversations we were having, they don't expect that. Mm. Next up, do you recall your first encounter with prejudice or racism? What was that like? My earliest memory, I had to have been like 12 years old at the time. Mm. And um, we were playing football on the corner. Suddenly, this unmarked car of, you know, undercover detectives, they drove up on the sidewalk, like, you know, so frantically. They jump out, and, and, and mind you, it's like me and three of my other cousins, and we all, like, under 15. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they tell us to get on the wall, and they search us. Talking about they got a call that uh, drugs are being sold on the corner. Of course they are. I'm Not like, brother, ass. like, we're literally throwing a football back and forth. Wow. Yeah. First of all, if you ever seen somebody sell drugs while they was playing football, <laughs> high salute. Yeah. High salute to that person, because, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and I remember being on that wall, and, you know, my aunties, my mom, my great-grandmother, you know, ultimately being helpless. Mm. They couldn't do nothing. Yeah. They had to sit there and watch their little black babies be touched by these white men. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and I ain't gonna lie, like, as a youngin', that really did, it did something to me, you know? I was in high school and I was working at this department store and I'm a teenager and one day I'm leaving out of work and I get arrested. And I'm like, yo, what I do? They said, you stole X amount of money. Now in Virginia, grand larceny is, is a felony. Anything over $200, they can lock Dang, you up as a felony. And I was like, man, like, you know, I didn't do, you know, I didn't do this, what's going on? I ended up going to jail. Oh my God. And I was a teenager. And coming to find out, it was my white colleague working at the same time, they assumed it was me. And if that had went down, there would have been no college for me. Yeah. There would have been no success. There would have been no CEO of Kickstarter, none of that. I would have went to jail. I would have been tried as an adult because I was 17. They would have tried me as an adult. And it was all because two men, a black man, a white man, they assumed the black man was the one that stole the money. Mm. And luckily for me, they found out it was, it was actually him. But at the end of the day, man, that could have like completely changed my life. On the CTA bus, Chicago Trent, like we was on the bus and this little white boy called me a nigger. Mm. Just casually called it. And I didn't really understand what that meant. My mother was pissed. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Snapped at his mother. And I just didn't understand. I think she understood and I didn't mm. understand. That was the first time she had to explain to me, like, you know, you know that wasn't a good thing that he said to you. Cause he said it so casually. Mm. Hey, nigger. Hey, nigger. No, like for real. Hey, like, it, it was just that like, casual. What's up? And I was like, like I, hold on. You had a friend. Your friend oh, this is my friend. Hold on. I, I, I what's good, my nigga? Hold on. I spoke <laughs> back to him. Like, oh, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, oh, he cool. Mom, 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 why are you mom, tripping? Like, oh, mom, oh, you say we good. say this all the time. And this is this is just my nigga. This is the early '80s before we was we was just saying that shit like that. How old was the kid? Same age. Like, like six. Oh, man. When George Floyd was murdered, we, my wife and I decided that we had to have the conversation with our children and let them know that everybody doesn't know you, so they don't, they're not gonna assume the best about you, right? And I watched the innocence leave my child, like instantly, yeah. it was gone. It's the saddest thing you ever have to do because you're, you're telling your kids that the game is rigged. Your, your player has to play different. It's heartbreaking. I love. I would love for young black kids of the next generation just to be free, right? Where they don't have to wake up with all this weight on their shoulder. Like it should die. It should be. It should be over now. Uh, and I have. And I have a. I have a black son, so I'm hopeful for that. All right, Jed. What's the next one? Oh man, this, this, this is a good one. Why is prioritizing mental health for black men? Mm becoming more important. Let's make sure a cup of tea, ain't it? Man. To look at how our mental health has taken a hit over these past uh, few years, suicide is up right now, man, like 80% when it comes to black men. 
and it's the third leading cause of death, ages 14 to like 26 amongst black men, black males. And as someone who has survived two suicide attempts, I attempted suicide twice, uh, my early 20s and then when I was 30, 10 years ago. Uh, when I left football, uh, for me, that was my identity. And when people ask me about suicide, I like to bring clarity because most people are not trying to take their lives because they're wanting to die. They're wanting to end the pain. Mm -hmm. The way we've been socialized as black men started when we was black boys. You better man up. You better not cry. And so you learn to live in the uh, paradox of your pain. Almost three years to this day, I tried to take my life. You know, I dealt with suicidal thoughts and I attempted right. to do so, right. you know, and it was because I felt like I didn't have anybody that I could talk to or reach out to. I felt like the world was coming down on me, you know, and I didn't feel the ability to be vulnerable and ask for help. It's a priority right now because black men lives are important. Yeah. Man, therapy and mental health, that is the number one priority. Yeah. When you spoke of mental health back in the day, you were crazy. Yeah. That's all mental health was. It was blanketed. Yeah. Crazy. And we didn't go to seek help. We never went to counselors because we were afraid to tell somebody our personal business. So we have to self-medicate either by trying to resolve this problem ourselves or we self-medicate through substances or through acting out in different other areas and things of that nature as well. Yeah. Without therapy, it's almost like you're fight, you're doing a boxing fight, but there's no break between rounds. Mm. And so therapy to me is like, Damn. it's like somebody rings the bell, mm. you sit down for a second, and there's a coach that's been watching from the outside, mm -hmm. and like, this is what you do wrong, this is what you do right, you're missing that, you're missing that, you're missing that, all right, go back in. Mm. That's, that, that's kind of my best way of description of like, therapy. Yeah. I feel like we as black men have just gone through so much that we've had to put up these barriers and these walls to protect our mental state to be able to reach these mountains that we've been able to climb. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's a reoccurring thing in our experience as black men is like having these experiences where we feel like our feelings are invalidated. But like, you know, really, we need to take more time to identify what it is that we're going through. We need to take more time to like, you know, process those emotions and you know to properly deal with them because what's gonna happen is you're gonna be going to set one day and you're gonna be crying on the stairs because you never took that time to really process what those emotions was that you're going through or what it is that you're feeling <laughs> yeah yeah mm. man where is my dinner it looks very delicious. Hey, it's your man Carlos Miller, and today I am in Lamert Park interviewing black men and their allies. Let's go. When you're performing, the black man head nod. Do you nod up or do you nod down? Up, always up, because it keeps that confidence. The nod up is like, what's up? And the nod down is like, nothing much. So if somebody hit you with a, what's up? And you said, what's up back? That could be aggressive. <laughs> There's only one correct answer. Sweet potato pie or pumpkin pie? It's a trap. Sweet potato pie. You're doing your job. I see what you're doing. That's a, you, that's a setup for sure. Just Sweet potato. Choice. Okay. Sweet potato. You're taking a picture with your homies. Say it's a group of four or five of y'all. Smile, no smile. No I'm smile. not smiling. What's the reason behind that? I think I look better. What does NAACP stand for? Okay, I know this one. Uh, National um, Advancement of... Come on. African and colored people? No. <laughs> <laughs> National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Oh my God, Amber, if we had a prize, you literally would have won. She already got it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Y'all are so in love, this is weird. <laughs> you can only eat one of these dishes. Macaroni. Let me ask the question. 
Did you look at the card? No, no, no. Start it over, because he's cheating. <laughs> you only get to eat one of these dishes. Okay. Your grandma's macaroni and cheese or your significant other's best dish. I'm going to have to go with significant other's best dish. You? I'm going to go with grandma. I'm going to keep it classy. I'm going to have to pick the family food. That, how you feel about that? I think I'm going to pick the family okay. food. <laughs> OK. Let's flip the script a little bit. What are some of your struggles that you have to deal with as a black gay man yeah. that you feel like other communities may not have to deal with? Yeah, I feel like as a, a black gay man, even in the black man conversation, we get left out of the conversation a lot. In terms of the intersectionality that comes with being gay, being black, being a gay black man, a lot of a Which lot one of times, comes first? My, my blackness is what you see first, so you know, but that might be different for somebody else. It depends on, you know, how you present. And look directly at the cameras and clear something up about black men. We are so many things. We are not just one thing. We are not a monolith. The black men, like, it's OK to feel, and it's OK to hug your friends, and it's OK to, like, love on each other. Black men, we do love black women. Even if some of them aren't with a black woman. Big facts. We love black women, and black women love us. And I think uh, we need to bridge that gap a little bit. We got to spread more black love. Now, listen, anytime I go to a restaurant, right, I love when they bring out compliments from the chef. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Actually, my favorite thing to say when they bring out a compliment. It's a nice tie, brother. I'll be like, yeah, yeah. I'll be like, I'm like, hey, tell the chef he looks nice. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, Kwame, what, what do we have here? So, uh, we have some Brussels suya. Like, suya is like a street snack in, in Western Africa, like grilled meats, uh, cooked over an open flame with tomatoes and onions. We have curry goat in the middle with crispy potatoes and green seasoning aioli some jerk chicken, uh, we have some jerk barbecue sauce. And for gentlemen here, we have pescatarian versions. Uh, there you go. So we Thank have uh, salmon escovich, and we also have curry shrimp with a little bit of toasted brioche. Well, listen, that curry goat is a little too far for me. Yeah. Brother. All right, brothers, we have a uh, Wagyu filet, filet mignon, and we topped it off with a foie gras butter. Mm. Then we topped that with caviar. And then we have a wonderful twice-baked potato with lobster, caviar, truffle cheese, Ooh. smoked gouda, Ooh. and a little bit of chives in there, man. My yeah, wife is going to hate watching yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, chef. Yes, sir. We got some three-hour stewed oxtail, Ooh. some coconut grits, and nacho mama's collard greens. Ooh. I never had oxtail like this. Great. OK, chef. <laughs> mm. I appreciate y'all. This is amazing. You cooked this? <laughs> Man, food is great. Conversation's been good. I think we're on to you, DeRay. What do we got next? Who has been the most important or influential black male figure in your life and why? So for me, it'd be my dad. Both my parents were addicted to drugs. Uh, my mother left when I was three. My father raised us. He's probably been in recovery for 30, 30-ish years. So in so many ways, I saw people struggle at their worst because my father sponsored so many people over the past 30 years, but I saw them put their lives back together. Like, I witnessed it, like, in our living room and in the dining room, and he just, like, really shaped my belief that people can, like, come from really hard moments and, like, do good things. Man, that's powerful, man. I feel so fortunate to have had my dad in my life, my entire life, but he always tells me, like, it's okay to cry. Like, let it out. And I, I be crying all the time, y'all, I'll be honest. Right. It's a high pressure situation that you're in. You gotta work, I'm working 16 hours a day. I'm tired. And he's like, it's okay to cry. And afterwards, you feel so much better. It's a release of emotions and pressure and all those sorts of things. And he never, ever made me feel judged for doing it. And you see, I be getting emotional easily yeah, because like, of, you know what I'm saying? Don't hold so it back. But yeah, no, it, it really actually is healthy. It's very healthy. My father raised me, but you know. We ain't have a great relationship. He might have knocked somebody upside the head every once in a while, whatever. And I had to grow up and understand, like, what informed how he mm -hmm. behaved, right? Like, he was, he grew up in Louisiana in the 50s and 40s, right? Yeah. Before, you know what I'm saying? And we grew up in segregation and you gotta have an went to Vietnam, right? got drafted, mm -hmm. you know what I'm it's saying? Certain conditioning that comes Yeah. From. So it's like putting that in context, I, I understand it more, you know? Absolutely. That's deep that you humanize your dad. I think a lot of times with our parents, we always like, even growing, you point your finger because you ain't get certain shit. And I think once you become an adult, the best thing you can do is like, 
Oh yeah, they was only 24. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, I, yeah why yeah, would yeah. I think they knew all that yeah, shit? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and this is what was going on and right. shit. Yeah. Yeah. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't have a whole lot of like male figures in my life. For me, I saw I saw RuPaul on TV. That was crazy to me. I'd never seen a black man being a black man like that. I really liked seeing and being inspired by black men who were black in a way that felt unique, that felt like they, it wasn't homogenized. My father was there, man. He was present. He was my soccer coach, my tennis coach. So I haven't known anything other than that. And I feel like, unfortunately, media and out there portrays us so differently from what the experience so many of us have had, who've yeah. actually had very present fathers in our lives. Yeah. I think there's a right of passage for um, men, black men specifically, where you have to kind of take your you have to take your father off of the pedestal that he's on mm. and he could be on it for the wrong reasons mm. and you almost have to bring him down to a human level i know i had to do that with my father yeah. my dad always made it clear to me that you know his dad wasn't in his life so for him it was a mission to make sure that he was in my life and that he was present and i appreciate that you know coming up he was the parent that i that i leaned into more when it came to like Your you know and everything Exactly, yeah. like, you know, stuff that was serious uh, that, uh, you know, might not want to go over with mom. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. To black fathers. To black yeah, fathers. That's right. <laughs> to black fathers, yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Through the legacy of brotherhood, black men have paved the way for the next generation. That brotherhood is the essential ingredient in our recipe for change. Like passing down a family gumbo recipe, the culture of black brotherhood continues to evolve. From the village elders guiding young men through rites of passage rituals to today's custom of prestigious fraternities, each generation adds something special to make it their own. The tradition of gumbo is a harmonious blend of meats, spices, and vegetables with bold and subtle flavors melding together into a tasty stew. The marker for a good gumbo is distinguished by its bold flavors. However, it is the subtle ingredients that give gumbo its unique taste. It's the subtle flavors that truly make the bold possible. We honor the bold accomplishments of world changers like Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King. But before there was Dr. King, there was his lesser known mentor, Minister Benjamin E. Mays. Mays' contributions were a key ingredient in the fight for economic equality. Born in 1894 to sharecroppers in South Carolina, Benjamin's parents instilled in him one of the most powerful ways to advance as a black man, education. Though one of the few black students at Bates College in Maine, this experience was revolutionary for his education and his desire for equality didn't stop there. In the 1920s, he moved to Chicago and worked on the railroads as a Pullman porter to pay his way through grad school. Fed up with low pay and mistreatment, he began labor organizing amongst the porters. Though fired for his actions, his efforts were successful. His groundwork became the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, a union that on June 1, 1935, became the very first African-American labor union to sign a collective bargaining agreement with a major U.S. corporation. Passions that are still felt today as folks continue to fight for fair pay and livable wages. After serving as Dean of Religious Studies at Howard U, Mays became the president of Morehouse College in 1940, mentoring students for almost 30 years, including one that spent hours with him discussing the advancement of black people, Martin Luther King. Just like the gumbo recipes we pass on in our families today, Benjamin passed on his recipe for change to Dr. King. Now, we must extend our legacy of brotherhood to achieve true liberation. What ingredient are you bringing to our recipe for change? Hey, Dan, you want to take <laughs> us away with the next question? What does a healthy romantic relationship look like to you? And do you believe you know how to receive love? Mm. Mm. I think a healthy relationship looks like, you know, two people who are open to counseling. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because I feel like there was definitely a point in my life where I didn't know if I deserved love. Mm -hmm. yeah. My moms and my dad separated when I was five years old. They were never married. You know what I'm saying? So I've never seen that growing up. And therefore, commitment was like this taboo thing for me because I've never seen an example of it. Mm. For me, I don't think I knew how to receive love until very, very recently. Mm. Through therapy, I realized that 
I was always good in the honeymoon stage. Once it got to the point where we start establishing boundaries and making plans and thinking about the future, something in me, the kid in me, would dip. Me and my lady, now we reached a point where, oh, I'm not going nowhere. And if she was the same, well, I'm not going nowhere either. So we just gonna have to figure this yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? And then to me, like, you know, a healthy relationship was just, they, they give you that space to just exhale. It's so many things you scar from just as a kid. Like even with my girl now, it was a time where like, I wasn't even sure if I deserved her. Cause little me wouldn't been able to pull you. And so like when my girl first started giving me all these compliments, I wouldn't receive that shit at first. Right. I'm like, yeah, you just talking shit. Yeah, yeah, I ain't yeah, a handsome yeah. motherfucker. Shut up. <laughs> call me fine. But, but, and that's because of that. Yeah. And, you know, once again, therapy is a beautiful thing. Well, I talked to my therapist about it, and then I had to have another moment where I go back to little kid me and say, hey, mm. you actually came, you became the cool kid. Really? Yeah. It's okay. I'm going to be honest with you. I really don't think I know how to receive love. All right, talk about it because of the wall that I have built up, because of the strength that I think I have to have all the time. And me receiving love is almost like being weak. And I'm like, man, here's a woman that loves me to death. Sometimes I have to talk to myself and say, hey man, damn, she just trying to hug you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Black love, the way it looks, is to recognize the forever changing organism that your relationship is. You're gonna need to be something different in every single season. You know, being married is the constant evolution of that person, mm -hmm. as well as yourself. And I think from 10 years from now, she'll be a different person, so will I. 20 years from now, when the kids move out, you know, all of those persons are gonna be different, and hopefully we can always love each other in the current state. Are we all in relationships here at this table? I'm not. No. no. I just started back dating, and let me tell you something, dating in your 40s, boy, woo. <laughs> not looking 40, because I get, you know, I get girls in their 20s, and I'm like, yo, I'm old enough to be your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> I can honestly say, man, uh, I just now learned how to receive. Mm -hmm. I've struggled uh, and longed for connection. I didn't get hugged a lot as a kid. It took this girl that I dated, man, that, that she all she wanted to do was like hug me all the time. And it was weird to me, man. Like she would just walk up, hey, hug me, hugs, hugs. And one day, man, she she, she hugged me and she says, Jay, just let go, dude. Just let go. Let me love you. Yeah. You know, one of the things that is interesting about being 37, gay. And, and dating guys is so hard at this age in some ways because it's like when I was younger, like we couldn't date. It was like the things that straight people sort of got to make mistakes and learn and did that. Like I, the people who are my age, like didn't get to do it so freely when we were younger and people are sort of doing things now. And I, and I just think about what it is like to, what it was like to grow up and everything was a secret. I didn't date until I was in my thirties, wow. my early thirties. I was single my entire twenties. What you said is very true. When you're queer, you, you're so behind on romance. So when I came out of the closet, baby, I had to like burst out and be like, fuck you about it. It wasn't enough to just be like, I'm gay. It had to be like, I remember going to Spencer's, I bought a rainbow belt. I wore it every day, whether it matched my outfit or not. I had to be an aggressive queer person. And like, you know, when you like, when you want to kiss your, kiss someone on the street without looking left to right, you have to make a decision not to look around. And you have to be like, I'm just gonna kiss you right now. It makes it really hard to date as an adult. Today we're offering you a vanilla bean ice cream with a crumble of pie crust <laughs> to garnish. Uh, purple sweet potato pie with coconut ice cream. This is not purple. It is sweet potato pie, but it's not purple. Well, it, when you bake it, it's not gonna stay the bright color. I, I, okay, as long as I'm, I'm not crazy. I'm like, does it look purple to you? No, it, it no, he's purple. at Fuchsia, so it doesn't, he doesn't count. We here, we're at the last course. Uh, we have golden rum cake oh. with a little sorghum on glaze, um, lucky sorrel, and malvern. Knife or spoon? With the, with Any the, way you wanna go, Okay, baby. I'm gonna Any go spoon, go. I'm gonna back to the top. Yeah, it's good? It's, good? it's a cinnamon roll, white chocolate, bread pudding. The story behind the dessert is my grandmother, she would make peach cobbler, she made cakes, things like that. Yep, yep. But she would make a bread pudding. 
I took uh, cinnamon rolls, toasted them, put them into a white chocolate custard. We topped it off with a, a, a nice vanilla caramel ice cream. And then we did an Uncle Nearest caramel sauce to go around the top of it. Man, I hope wow. you enjoy it, brother. Yeah, so we will. All right, Bob, you got the uh, next girl for us. What we got? As a black man, how do we feel our community views those who identify as LGBTQIA+. I want to say out loud, black people are not monolithic. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. I, I grew up in a very affirming home. I'm not the first queer person in my family. I want to say that there are lots of black people who are incredibly affirming to queer people. You know how much it means to see someone like Jay-Z having an entire song about his mom who's a lesbian and how he loves her? And then seeing Jay-Z and Beyonce receiving awards for their allyship? Like, I don't rem who Who else? Who else? What is it? I remember seeing videos of Prince making fun of Michael Jackson for being gay. Prince, who was in high heels, pumps, and a 30-inch laid wig, talking about, <laughs> I don't want to seem gay. Right. So what am I supposed to do when, when the gayest straight man in the world <laughs> don't want to be seen as gay? What am I supposed to do? I think, too, um, to add to that from um, a clinical perspective is that people don't realize the battle of coming out. Because it's, 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 I've worked with a lot of same-sex couples and, and a lot of the uh, LGBTQ uh, community and teens and realizing that's a daily process for them. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I was having this conversation with the student that was coming out, he said, and the battle was, I don't want to tell my mom. And the question that I asked him, I said, how important is your freedom? And I said, if your freedom means that much to you, then you have to free yourself by living your truth. Do you know how many people are waiting until their parents die so they can have freedom? A lot of people. Exactly. Wow. I would say, um, you know, that conversation is not safe for so many people, right? Like, this no, idea, like, they want to be free, but you are really afraid of, like, getting beat up or people being homophobic. And I think now, you know, the way we start to think about the language, too, is, like, this idea of inviting in versus coming out. I don't think we have good public language for homophobia that doesn't end in physical violence. Growing up in the black church, I feel like I was absolutely taught incorrectly. Uh, love the sinner, hate the sin. Love you, don't support the lifestyle. And I remember actually the first thing that changed in my mind wasn't even the church. It was when my son was born. And I remember holding him and he was like premature, so he was like four pounds. So he like fit right here in my arm. And I remember thinking, well, there's no way whoever he loved, whatever he did, I would ever treat him differently, you know what I'm saying? And I remember that was the first time that thought was challenged. And I think as I aged, and honestly, because of the internet, I really can say, the internet helped me challenge a lot of these beliefs. Before my parents or before the church, it was people writing, tweeting, reading articles and learning. And I think I had to unlearn a lot of things that I was taught. And I think what's really interesting is my children, who, you know, one generation removed, totally different way of seeing the world, right? Because of tolerance and acceptance, the way they, they teach me about pronouns. They came home and like, yeah, my homegirl is they, them now. I'm gonna I'm go upstairs. And I was like, wow. <laughs> I personally have been really excited about the shift that I've seen in the culture because it's taking everything just into this place of, man, we're all human. You know what I mean? We're all trying to figure it out. And who you love has nothing to do with me. How you dress has nothing to do with me. I think the misunderstanding too is that we need to understand. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Always. That is such a complex question because I try to spread love as much as I possibly can. I try to protect as many people as I possibly can. And I try to educate as much as possible because I know how difficult it is already having this skin color, but then to also identify as someone that may be deemed as different makes it a thousand times harder. Yep. And so for me, I see the, the nature of our community and how we, we tear each other down just because of someone's sexual orientation and, and, and what they desire or who they are inside. And I really, really hope that anyone who's watching this understands the impact that you can have and that you choose to be better. You choose to be uh, a better person and educate yourself because this can deeply impact someone's life, and I've seen it happen personally. Yeah. 
There is a perception that black men don't do enough to protect black women. What should we do differently to shift that narrative? Ooh, that's a good one. Being raised by a black mother, a single mother, you have the perception that she's gonna take care of everything. Right. Right? And so the, the curse of having a single mother as, as your primary parent is that you assume that black women are just fine. I think that recognizing as you grow up, she wasn't fine, she had to be fine. Mm -hmm. She didn't have nobody else. And then if we have grown up with that, we see other black women, ah, you're fine. Nah. I need you to see me as an equal and I need you to give me the same opportunities you have. Because supporting black women and protecting black women is two different things. Correct. You know what I'm saying? So we have to think about what opportunities do I have that my sister may not be able to get, right? I think over the pandemic, one thing I learned about was intersectionality, right? That sometimes black women suffer as a direct result of black men's success. So I had, to, I had to like look inside myself and say, well, am I doing enough to support black women that are outside of my wife? And I remember one part I had to check myself, I book comedians and when I was going on tours, and if I had a male comedian I book, I didn't worry if I asked him to go on tour, what's gonna happen to his kids. But a woman comedian friend of mine, I'm like, oh, she got kids, I don't wanna bother her. And I realized I'm robbing her of the same agency that I would give a man. Yeah. Well, I feel like there was a recent situation that happened. When black women are screaming out that, you know, they've been attacked or they've been wrong or they've been hurt, I think we need to do a better job at not ridiculing them. What are you talking about? Meg the Stallion got shot. And nobody wanted to believe foot. her at first. Yeah. I have, a, I have a daughter, you know, and so, like, is, if she came to me right away and that's what the fuck happened, that's what the fuck happened. I did an interview right after and started talking about it, and they cut it out the interview. Mm. Wow. Kendrick, we, we are part of the insecure family, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I love the way Issa moves. Yeah. yeah. I, I just do. I, like, even though, you know, you've been on that set before, I've never seen so many women with all those different roles on set before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it, like we were the, like, minority, the yeah. guys. Yeah, roles <laughs> in front of and behind. Yeah, yeah for real. You could literally sit with the other guys. <laughs> we go all, yeah. that's how minimal. And they call them men secure. Men secure. <laughs> men secure. That's, our, that's our group tech. <laughs> and so, <Men> but, secure. <laughs> but it's a beautiful thing. But at this, I always felt like with all of us, we we in this cool group that we always felt like we wanted to make sure we, we had their back because they had ours. Yeah, especially being that so much of us was raised by black women. Yeah, I think women are like the caretakers of our community. I, I feel like a lot of, as, especially as black entertainers, our number one supporters oftentimes are black women. Mm -hmm. Correct. And those are the people who lift us up when nobody else is there, who yeah. support us when we're down. And so even for me, I started a production company with my father called Scribner Productions. Thank you, appreciate it. I don't mean to put myself in this. No, but, uh, yeah, 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 very, uh, but our main goal is to put people on screen who look like me, create diverse voices and diverse stories. Our main goal is to tell a, a story that's as authentic as possible and put black women in p places of power. What black women do for us, they get yeah. in the door and they hold it open. Yeah. And yes. you got in the door, yeah. and the first thing you did was hold it's it open. Exactly. Yeah. And like, it, it takes people like you to give those opportunities. Yeah. Art in our community has always been something that's been a happy medium for us to get our messages out to the world. So, you know, tonight, the way I'd like to recap this dinner and celebrate is by us all creating an art piece together. So, in honor of the Memphis uh, sanitation strike in 1968, you know, I'd like for us all to create our own I am a man affirmation. The 1968 Memphis sanitation strike, they had those famous I am a man signs, right? And they were fighting for equality, dignity, and respect, which, you know, in this year, we're still fighting for. So, you know, we'll start with the I am, and you fill it in with whatever being a black man means okay. to you. We don't want society to label us whatever they think we are. I want us to take that power back into our own control. And we've got an artist who's gonna come and compile all these into one big piece of art. And we are gonna define ourselves and we're gonna be the men that we wanna be. Yeah. 
can call me when you need me. I heard that you were proud cause you spotted me on TV. You know I'm out here working cause I'm really trying to make it. I know that you were stressing, you just probably couldn't take it. I don't judge you for it. We're all sinners, we all could use a little help. I swear the last time that I saw you, you were someone else. I, I wrote several. I wrote, I am powerful. I am a father, I am a husband, I am peace. I am an unstoppable force. Well, what you write down? I wrote, I am a healing man. I, I like that. that. Jay, what you got, dog? I am an evolved black man, meaning that I'm a man of uh, evolution, man, a man of growth, a man of continuing learning. I am a blessed man, you know? I'm very blessed in my life. I am somebody I deserve full equality. I am confident in my ability to contribute to leaving the earth better than how I found it. I am a husband, a father, a chef, a community leader, a owner of a business, a thoughtful person, and someone who would love to see change. I know it's been a long road. I know it's been a long road. I know it's been a long road. And you've been feeling all alone. 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 So I'm just hoping that you find peace. I am a free man. Hey. Uh, You are. I am. Mr. Loverman. My, my lover but man. he's for the streets. I am, <laughs> I am worthy of good things. I am strong. I'm a genius. I'm hardworking. And I'm sacred. Mine is, I'm not no perfect man. I'm trying to do the best that I can with what it is I have. That is my mission. I'm just trying to do the best that I can every day. I am a dreamer, a doer, a giver. I am a human being, I am another person, and I am the same as you. I am love to all. So I'm just hoping that you find peace. I'm just hoping that you find peace. And find your way back home. Find your way back home. So who's coming tonight? We got the cock diesel. Former, <laughs> that just came to mind because this dude is massive. <laughs> he is a big dude. He is a big dude. I don't know why. That I had one of my one of my friends who was white. Was like he spikes his hair up using gel, and he was just using the Murray's, and he was like, oh my god, this holds so much better. And I'm, like, oh, I'm like every. Other Who's the goat? MJ. I'm gonna say Kobe. LeBron James, y'all. Michael Jordan had a better Space Jam. <laughs> <laughs>